What's up, guys? Uh, it's Harry. I'm just editing the podcast right now, and it's definitely going to be a good one. Uh, James and I have decided to take the podcast in a bit of a different direction. Uh, we're going to be transitioning from the interview style to talking about the economy, the overall market, as well as small caps. Alex will also be joining us in the next episode. He's also going to be joining us around once a month, and we're going to be just talking about the economy, uh, stuff that's going on in the world, and as well, of course, with Alex, we're going to be talking about some small cap shorts as well. Uh, so in this episode, again, we're going to be talking about the economy, the overall market, small caps, and uh, that's going to be kind of the way that we're doing this uh, moving forward. As well, I would just like to say a quick thank you to uh, all our supporters weekly, all our supporters kind of monthly, uh, everyone who tunes in, uh, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you guys. And definitely let us know in the comments below kind of how you feel about this transition. Uh, if you like this episode, uh, some things to work on and stuff like that. So uh, I'd just like to say thanks a lot and uh, let's dive right in. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Uh, it is Sunday, July 24th, 2022. So everything we're talking about, it's going to be kind of revolved around this time. And yeah, so we're going to be talking a lot about like the large cap market this time, you know, overall market trends and everything like that. So let's kind of dive into it. So Harry, what have you been kind of noticing about the large cap market this last week? Uh, for me, it's been pretty, pretty stronger. I mean, uh, all the way from like, you know, July 19th. Uh, my birthday was actually June 18th. I tweeted out, I thought it was market bottom for a little bit. Uh, and we ended up kind of rallying from 380 on the SPY. We we got to 400, then we kind of took a breather. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people are starting to forget about the war. I think a lot of people are starting to kind of, uh, inflation start of kind of, it's, it's kind of becoming old news. It's pretty relevant, but like everyone knows about it now. Everyone's heard about it now. Um, Everyone kind of understands its effects, I believe now. And so I think a lot of people are just saying to themselves, you know what, um, I think it's time to put some money back in the market. The market it has, you know, taken quite, quite a hit, you know, since April, since March. Um, so I think that a lot of people are going to start trying to put money back to work. I know a lot of people are saying, oh, uh, hedge funds are not buying, no one's buying, but obviously someone's buying other than retail to make these kind of types of moves. So for me, I'm pretty bullish. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to be shaking their heads going against me, but to me, I am pretty bullish. I know that a lot of the, uh, let's say, leader stocks have taken hits and that is, you know, sign of, you know, things not being healthy. But for me, I am, I'm just, I'm pretty bullish because I think that you know, for the most part, uh, we have a ton of people thinking that we're going to zero, which will never, never fucking happen. And I just think that we've taken quite a hit due for a bounce. Pretty bullish. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of major names have bottomed. Um, I don't want to make any like major assumptions, but like like there's companies like Apple. Like I I think a lot of them have. I think the there's a lot of names like Tesla that still could, they have a lot of room to come down just because of how overinflated they were. Yeah. Um, especially during like the COVID yeah. era, right? Where there was just that cult following on some of these stocks. So as the air might take a little longer for them to come out, um, yeah. just because, you know, you look at a company like Tesla and then you compare it to Apple and obviously Apple's way more sturdy as far as cash flow, cash on hand and all that stuff. And, yeah. and, and the thing is, I think the indices are just, just going to take a little bit longer to kind of bottom and really put in a meaningful kind of area support. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I think people are scared, you know, but it was, I, I tweeted about it last week and it was, I think it was last Thursday or something like that a week ago. And I just, I woke up and, t and Apple had taken a huge beating and it was at 143 bucks. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, this is Apple, you know, yeah. this company is not going anywhere until I walk outside and I don't see people just staring at their iPhones or whatever. Yeah. I will never not have faith in that company. Yeah. So that was something like for me, I personally started buying um, at least a little bit, just get my feet wet. And you know, it's, that's it. I think we are at a point where people are starting to get a little bit more confident because yeah. There was such fear. Like we hit max fear and max like scared feeling that the market was going to zero, like you said. Yeah. So yeah. 
and also a lot of big big cap companies right now you know like you're looking at apple uh you know q3 earnings are going to come out you know they're going to slow hiring they're going to slow spending they're not going to do as much research i think that's a lot of fear-based uh stuff you know uh i guess like a lot of people to me the thing is with recessions and stuff like that in 2008 no one expected it when things start to crash no one really expects it um and for for a lot of people to be coming out expecting uh a crash or expecting uh, this or that. To me, it's just, I'm a little weary because the the biggest panics, the biggest drops are going to be when people don't expect it. And when people yep. do expect it and they start getting on the wrong side of the trade and they, it was just like COVID, right? COVID market tanked. How many times did I hear people going off, you know, you know, all, all spring, all summer saying the market it's, it's due for a crash, due for a crash. Yep. And it just kept going up and up and up. And I think that's where we're at right now, where the market, yes, it's taken a beating, but a lot, a lot of people are continually saying, oh, it's got to go lower, got to go lower, got to go lower. Yep. Right. And when we start rebounding, people get on the wrong side of the trade. They're too convicted. Uh, we see it all the time on a low float squeeze where people are saying, this has got to go down, got to go down, yep. got to go down. People are caught on the wrong side, wrong side, wrong side. And then as we keep kind of elevating higher, people get more stubborn and more stubborn. And that's what kind of leads to those moves to the upside because people are saying right now, you know, oh, we got to go lower. You know, how many times, like I literally posted on my Instagram, okay? And I said, yeah, I think the bottom's in. You know, how do you feel about that? Do you know how many DMs I got from, from fucking uh, degenerates who are like, this is going lower. Oh, you're an idiot. Way wrong. Way wrong, Harry. You're an idiot. You know, yep. when I get those types of DMs, I know I'm on the right track at least. Yep. Because yep. when okay. you have people who are so passionate that will go out of their way to DM you to, to say that you're wrong. It's a crypto. Yep. Yep. 100%. Same idea. And yeah. And so, can't go. So, so they'll just keep fucking uh, chirping yep. me and I'll keep fucking making money. <laughs> I, think, I think the reality is that we know the Fed basically crashed the stock market to try to curb inflation, right? And try to kind of reset things. Yeah. And I do think it was needed. I think we I think they did what they kind of had to do. You know, obviously it hurts a lot of people, but the reality is that everybody fell into the uh the romance that the stock market only goes up and that yeah. everything was super easy and and it was the easiest job in the world. So I think now too most most people know inflation is here right inflation's here to stay the whole transitory idea right is thrown out the window it's here to stay i think major companies like apple um who else was it that said they were slowing hiring tesla oh, yeah, the, meta tesla yep and the, we're preparing for a potential market slowdown yeah we call it a recession but no one ever said that a recession has to be the worst thing in the world no one ever said it has to be huge like oh wait was brutal right yeah but it doesn't happen. But OA people didn't expect. People are no, kind of expecting like, this now and they're better yep, prepared. Exactly. When have we ever seen banks like, like Jamie Dimon talking about how they're preparing themselves for an economic hurricane, right? Why would they be telling people that if they, they didn't want everyone else to get caught off guard and yeah. screw themselves over? Yeah. So I, I just, I kind of feel like this time around, it's a much more controlled downturn. Um, and what's what kind of news could come out at this point that would change that sentiment, right? Because gas and oil it's slowly coming down, but it's you know it's going to be expensive for a bit. Inflation's here. We know markets are slowing. Yeah. What what else is there? You know yeah. that there's no pandemic coming out again. God, knock on wood, kind of thing. You know, there's nothing yeah. that's going to change things. Well, except monkeypox. The WHO actually declared it a global emergency yesterday. I saw so that. I saw that. It, I'll be I watching SIGA tweets. for that. I'll be watching yeah. that ticker. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a, a potential, you know. Yeah, Yo, you froze for a, for a little bit. Oh, can you hear me still? Yeah. That's weird. Um, like I said, just, you know, everyone on Twitter is super bearish, super negative. And I feel like it's the same as small cap trading, right? It's like, if you're on the wrong, if you're on the same side of the trade as every single person, it's probably the wrong trade. Yeah. You know, so. hundred percent. And yeah. I just wanted to transition because uh, Graham Stephan has been tweeting pretty heavily about the whole auto industry collapse. Um, and he says that nearly one in every four loans 
uh, default in Washington, uh, D.C., as far as car loans go, which is pretty bad for the car car industry. Um, you know, if car loans were to kind of, I don't know, if they were to like default or there was a crash as far as, you know, cars went and it, it caused the price of cars to drastically increase, what do you think that that would do as far as um, cars, price of oil? Yeah, it's funny. So I, I, I've kind of been following a bunch of these guys who have been tweeting about this. And it, I think it's even worse than, than even the reference stand or whatever, whatever it was. He, he's made it out to be. Um, because I was looking online and I guess a lot of people, I think it was 18% or some crazy number. I got to get the actual number. Have, have Are behind more than three months on their car payments. Now, I don't know how that works because it because cars aren't like homes, right? So if, if someone yeah. defaults in their car, it just gets repoed, right? There's someone's gonna come take it and then it's gonna go to auction, right? At least I think so. So I don't think that would have an overall effect on the on the stock market, but I do think it would drastically flood the car market with like supply, you yeah. know, because for the longest time right now, we've had it's been hard to get cars because of the chip issues. Uh, people have been buying them like crazy and prices have skyrocketed. So if anything, I think it would do the opposite. I think there'd be a lot of cars now available and people would be hurting for it though. So, you know, you could probably scoop up cars pretty cheap, but I don't, I don't know what it would do to the overall market. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of wondering because it says auto loan delinquency rates continue to drop across the board. Uh, 4% of outstanding auto debt is at least 90 days late. That's down from 5.3 and 20 days in 2010, while well, another 5% are 30 days overdue. Uh, so it's not it's not too bad. This was March yeah. 8th, 2022. So maybe we're getting a little worse. I, um, I think, I, though, what that shows is that as a country, we are falling behind, right? Yeah. Because I, I find now the middle class is starting to say more publicly that they are struggling, right? Yeah. Being a middle class citizen making you know i don't even know what middle class is in this country anymore but whatever that number is not enough right you know and so anyone below that line now they're the ones they're they're screwed you know as things get more expensive food gets more expensive and if inflation stays the rate it is now and they continue to raise interest rates or yeah. you know they fuck with the market a little bit I mean, what's going to happen? We're going to get more of that. So, like, I think the scary thing is just seeing that that number could go from, you know, 90 days late to mm -hmm. 120 days late, 150 days late. And then what? Yeah. Right? I mean, you could really scoop up some cheap used cars, you know? Like, yeah, seriously. Graham's like, if we continue on this trajectory, it could be due for an 18% decline. Um, you know, average new vehicle, like, prices in cars are insane right now. Yeah. I mean... They're they're insane. So that needs a kind of a reset too. So um, maybe Everything. if if you know they repossess all these fucking cars and yep. uh, everyone kind of goes back to ground zero, maybe prices can kind of cool off and reset a little bit again. Yeah. And uh, you know that might be some good news for people who want to buy a car. Dude, I think I think we've as a country we've just built up this lifestyle of like debt, right? I know people who make six hundred thousand dollars a year. But they're driving around in a fifteen hundred dollar a month car, and it's just like when you do the math of it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I bet a lot of the like delinquencies are people who just overspent. It's not even like it's not like they were trying to stay within their budget. You know, they took the stimulus checks and they were like, oh, I you know I, I saved a lot of money during the pandemic. Let me go get a Tesla. Right. Yeah. I've had a Tesla. That car payment's not fucking cheap. Yeah. You know, but I think people did that shit because they felt like kind of money was so good, right? And that's kind of what we're talking about now is yeah. that things kind of need to reset. And yeah. I think the auto industry is it. I actually recently was just looking at a secondary car and uh, I wanted just a car that I kind of like beat around on. And there was um, one of the new Ford Broncos was being sold at a BMW dealership next to my um, shop. Mm -hmm. So I went over and they were only asking like 38K, right? Yeah. And I was like, oh, I, I drove it. I didn't really like it as much as I thought I would. So I walked away. Guy calls me the next day. Now it's 44K. Calls me a week later. Price went up to 49K. Hmm. And then it sold for like 55,000. Some dude bought it. And I'm like, 
do we not see the problem? Like we're buying cars for way over their value. Yeah. So it's the same as buying a house for over value, except people change cars way faster. When you're yeah. going to go sell that, you're going to be underwater. So you're going to yeah. be stuck in that toxic debt for the rest of your life. And it'll take forever to get out of it unless you just basically lease out or something like that. I mean, and that's what we're doing with houses. So I think people would just need to slow down on their spending, yeah. especially during times of like inflation and stuff like that, because every little dollar is going to kind of save you. You know, it's going to keep you from like getting into these problems and these issues. Yeah, and exactly right. I mean, if you look at at least when you buy a house, you know, normally you're going to the value is not depreciating like it is yeah. a goddamn Ford Bronco. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in five years, how much is that Bronco going to be worth? In 10 Way years, less. how much is that yeah. Bronco going to be worth? Practically right? nothing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. Speaking of all this spending, a lot of Ukraine spending been going on. You know, I've been seeing a ton from the United States side. Not as much from Canada, but the United States has pumped a ton of money into Ukraine. Uh, how do you guys feel about that? <laughs> I am. Um, it's funny. So my job, so I get to talk to a lot of people daily, right? So I would say most people are confused because we sit here all day long. We talk about how bad things are in our country right now. We talk about how poverty is probably at all time highs. Um, the wealth gap is at all time highs. Cost of everything is at all time highs. Yet here we are as a country donating billions on um, billions of dollars to another country. Yeah. I personally, I do feel... Now, this is as apolitical as possible. It has nothing to do with politics. I think we're doing it to basically pat ourselves on the back and like say that we're doing what we're supposed to as the world leader. But the reality is Ukraine doesn't really stand a chance, in my opinion, against Russia long term. And I think, again, we're just doing this to kind of stay in the middle, but not overstep too far into Russia. Yeah. But I just don't understand it. I don't understand the spending. I don't I I don't. I feel as a country we need a lot of help here and we're yeah. fa we're failing, you know, as yeah. a democracy and there's a lot of problems. So Yeah. And and in Canada, we've spent around 3.4 billion in total financial and military support and uh you know, the Canadian government will say that they're proud to lead the way, but also um we were we were working on this uh this turbine for Russia and we were working on it kind of before uh, the whole the whole uh, sanctions were put in. We were working on it uh, before Russia decided to quote unquote attack or you know whatever invade whatever you know you want to say. And um, you know we <laughs> so we're working on this this pipeline. We put the sanctions in, and now Russia says, "Well, we want that back now." And you know Canada's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" You know. And they're like, well, we're not going to give any gas to Europe then if you don't give us that damn turbine back. So what does Canada do after we've invested $3.4 in total support? And, and we and the United States has spent a lot more money than that. And uh, all of a sudden, what happens? We give it back. We defy our own sanctions. <laughs> so, you know, that says a lot about, about Canada as a whole. And also... You know, you can't slant Trump for when he went to the uh, world leaders meeting and told Germany, listen, and told the other European countries, everyone was laughing at him in Germany. All the Germans were laughing at him. Yep. And he sat there and he said, listen, you guys are relying too much on Russia. You're relying way too much on Russia, you know, and when you rely too much on a country like that, they're going to take advantage of you. Yep. And they all laughed at him, said he was crazy, said that would never happen. And boom. You know, we're in the mess that we are in now. And if we never relied on Russia at all, if, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't do business with Russia, we'd be completely fine. But, you know, the majority is a lot or the reality is, is that the majority of oil in Canada that was being pumped was not Canadian oil. Yep. It was Russian, right? Yep. It was from the Russians and it was from the Saudis. You know, I was pumping my car in Canada with Russian oil when Canada has a you know, a crazy oil reserve that we could be pumping right now. Yeah, America you know, so is oil again, reserve too. It's just things yeah. that don't make sense, right? Everyone yeah. was protesting for this whole climate agenda. And don't get me wrong, I believe in climate change. It's just that we have to do it in a responsible way. And yeah. just because we don't pump the oil in Canada does not mean that it makes 
you know, a difference if we get it from Russia or Canada or the United States or the Saudis, yeah. it's still the same amount of pollution going in the air. People are still driving their cars. People aren't right now moving to, uh, you know, a renewable source. And even these electric cars are not necessarily, uh, you know, renewable sources, right? Yeah. Yes, we're, we're plugging it in and, and we're not, uh, you know, getting it from, from, and we're not putting gas in our car, but you know, how do we make that power? You know, let's go another step further. How are we making that power? Pollution. So we're still polluting either way. And when, it, and when like three to four times the carbon emissions are, you know, being pumped in just to make one of those cars, it's like, does this make actual sense? Yeah, no, dude, I think the, the biggest issue is as countries, like the bigger ones, right? Like the US, Canada, China and all that. We are major consumers. Right. And we've come so far to expect things to always be very easy, very cheap and yeah. kind of whenever we want it, we can get it. Right. So morals take a back seat because look at this whole Russian thing. Right. If the cost of gas keeps going up. Right. Because we're den denouncing taking Russian oil or from other any other foreign agencies like the Saudis or whatever. The cost is going to go sky high. And if the cost of oil goes sky high and gas goes sky high. Everything else goes with it. Vacations, rentals, so much gets hurt. Cars, all of it, right? So at the end of the day, I kind of feel like as bad as it is what Russia is doing, which is awful, our countries are going to continue to do business with them. We're going, we're going to have to, because yeah. in America, at least, that's all people complain about. For some reason, the cost of gas, because it, maybe it's because the biggest day-to-day -day, like expense that you, you, you touch besides food, it's all I hear about. It's all I hear about and how it affects things. So I don't know. Personally, I'm not a huge believer that electric vehicles are going to be like the next big step. Uh, the ne sorry, step further, but the next big step. I think oil is here to stay for a long time. I personally, like, recently just bought a small basket of like oil stocks because of that reason. I think we're still a hundred years away from being fully electric. We don't yeah. have the infrastructure. We don't even know about actually recycling the batteries and how much damage that does. Yeah. And on top of it, what does the average electric car cost? I mean, not a hybrid, a fully electric car. It's got to be over 50K. That yeah. like minimum, right? The Lucid is 150, 138 or something like that. And Tesla start at like, call it 40 or 50 around there. The average person can't afford that. And we're not even close to that. So... And as the economy gets worse, people aren't going to have the money to go buy a, I don't know, whatever the cheapest electric car is. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And I, I mean, also like, uh, you know, it, it does like when you drive a Tesla, like how much of it is status? Like how much of it is like yeah. the same thing as buy yeah, Rolex far, but, or yeah. buying some new Gucci slides or whatever. Right. You know, I heard this, this funny joke last night. It was funny where this woman said, met a bunch of guys from Harvard yesterday, and I kept pretending like I never heard of that school just to piss them off. It's funny. Yeah. And uh, she goes, one of them legit turned red when I said Harvard. What is that? Like a local community college. And then uh, the woman comments below it. She said, reminds me of my coworker who, whenever she sees a Tesla at the gas station or something, she'll look over and go, wow, the new Toyotas look really cool, and the drivers freak the fuck out. Jesus. Which is hilarious because it's I true. mean- are you driving it for the planet or are you driving it for a status, right? You know, maybe yeah. you can say, well, I'm saving the planet, but I think a lot of people are driving it as, you know, for a status symbol. Yeah. And it's because it's fucking expensive. Just recently, I was like, uh, my buddy was looking at the Model X and the one that you can want, like the nice ones, like 120,000, you know, and, and yeah. again, it's nice car, but majority of America is not going to afford that, you know, especially yeah. now you know, with savings yeah. and everything at all time lows. So, and people don't care about the environment when their day-to-day -day life sucks, Man. right? If they're struggling to get food, struggling to get to work, save money, they could give less of a shit about the environment, which is not great, but that's the reality. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. What did I, what did I also see? Um, I'm just trying to look it up. I saw something about like a healthy economy and a, a, a healthy uh, environment. Um, you know, if, if you have, a, you know, a very, very healthy economy, it does translate to a healthy environment yeah. just due to the fact that, you know, um, you know, if people have 
money in the bank, maybe they will say, okay, I'm going to put this towards incentives to help the environment, right? People who are lower class tend to be harder on the environment just due to the fact that like, what types of foods are they eating? Is it going to be fresh foods or is it always going to be coming from a package? What types of, uh, you know, like how, how much are they driving, right? Do they need to drive to work every day? You know, um, as far as kind of, uh, like how, how much are they, are they going through products? You know, are they recycling? Well, probably not because they can't go to a a bottle depot to cash in their 10 cent a bottles. Right. So there's all these little things that trickle down where you wouldn't really think about it. Um, so for me, I think a healthy economy, uh, a healthy environment go hand in hand. Also, I just want to bring up one thing in Canada. I was listening to this uh, uh, other podcast the other day, and they said that um, he, so he's a mortgage broker. He's out of Halifax. And yep. he said that, uh, you know, before he, his, like before the pandemic, before the housing values really, really took off, about 30 to 20% of his business was these like reverse mortgages, right? So when people take the equity out of their house and like basically take like a new mortgage or whatever, right? But now that houses have risen so crazy, a lot of people are taking the equity back out of their house and doing these new finance deals, right? So like, let's say that your house is worth 600K, right? And you get a mortgage for 600K and now it's worth 800K they'll give you that 200K difference, right? Yeah. To kind of reverse that mortgage. They'll give you that 200K. You take on that 200K more debt, but at the end of the day, when you quote unquote sell your house, well, we're going to get that money back anyway, so it doesn't matter. But I was thinking to myself, like, what if the housing market drastically falls in, in, in prices, right? Yeah. He said he went from 20 to 30. Now he's doing, it's like over 50% of his business. Are these that's like wait, equity, right? you know, I mean, right? That's Which is what crazy. Happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, that could be a, that could be a real, you know, reason for a crash. Well, I guess, I guess that's what we, we circle back to is that we are just consumers. My, my dad, he, he builds um, kitchens and baths and like homes, right? Yeah. He's never been busier. This guy has been in business for 35 years and he's done well, but he's the busiest he's ever been. How does that make sense in a time where we're in a quote unquote recession or a market slowdown, right? It's like what you're saying. People are pulling out money because they feel that things have been so good for so long, right? It's the same concept. Like, let's say when Tesla was trading at $1,000 a share, you could have taken a loan out against your Tesla stock and then used it as long as it didn't drop. It's the same, same idea, same thought. Now yeah. with housing, it's going to happen. If it, of course, it's going to happen, right? Yeah. It has to happen because ninety nine percent of people I know can't afford a house right now. They can't buy a house at these prices. They can't put down ten percent or even do the first time home buyers. It's it's not going to end well, right? No. But I still think we're a little bit away from it. That's why, like stock market wise, I do feel like we've bottomed, and I feel like we're going to slowly grind around for a little bit, but. Q1, Q2 of, of uh, 23, we might start to see a different story. You know, yeah. that's when we might just see some economic collapse. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that uh, I don't think that they'll let everything go at once. I think every, every market will take its turn. So yeah. stock market was first. It could be the bond market after a lot of people have been talking about the bond market. It could be a big yeah. bond crash as well. Um, but I don't think that everything will go at once. If, if everything goes at once, it will be utter chaos, right? Depression. They want to do this soft landing and whatever. Yeah. So I think it's going to be maybe the housing market and the auto market and, uh, you know, just general prices, oil, whatever you want to see. It's going to be different assets, uh, you know, in my opinion, you know, each, each different thing will take its turn. I don't think yeah. it'll be all at once. Um, But even you have like people who are heads of the banks saying it's time for a little bit of a reset. It's time for a little bit of a crash. They're going to do, they're going to keep hiking those rates until they get that. It'll be a fed induced crash. Um, But in my opinion, you know, it's okay for me. Like it's all right because right now I don't own a house, you know, I'm in an apartment right now. Uh, So maybe it will be good for me when uh, if the interest rates are high though, like, it's different because like for someone like me, if you have cash, you can put cash into that. Well, the high interest rate doesn't bother you. But if, if those high interest rates bother you, 
you know, it's going to be the same price kind of either way, just different, different, you know, payment, you know, yep. like, so right now we have very, very expensive houses, you know, yes, the rates are climbing a little bit, but the rates are still generally low, yep. but okay. Let's say we have low equity. Yes. The housing market has quote unquote crashed, but we still have insanely high interest rate payments on those, on those yeah. low houses. So you know, are you really like, I hear all these people, oh yeah, I'm buying the debt, buying the debt, buying the debt. But yeah. Yeah. You're buying the debt, but at a crazy fucking high interest rate. So unless you have cash, um, yeah. you're pretty much screwed on this dip as well. Yeah. And look, we've been here before, right? If you look at like history, we've been uh, historically way higher, right? I mean, we were at 12%. I think it was my parents' first uh, mortgage was like 12, 12, nine. Right. And I understand the argument of, you know, the houses were different prices back then and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is we've been here before. And I was listening to the uh, the Berkshire Hathaway, the last annual meeting. And Buffett basically said that, you know, you can say what you want about them, but he basically said, we have to trust the Fed to do what they were created to do. And it's going to it's gonna hurt for a bit, but we need to stay on top of our like currency and make sure that we're not screwing ourselves over, you know, yeah. which kind of cycles me to my next t- subject I wanted to bring up real quick. Did you see that article? Um, I think it's from QTR. He was saying how Russia and China basically have announced a new global currency. Yeah. Right. And that's scary. That's yeah. scary because the reason the dollar has been so strong and we've been able to borrow as much money as we can and have is because we're the global reserve currency. Yeah. Now, what cha- what do you think changes if that? turns around if they know yeah, how I mean that time. is something that a country will go to war over right for that yeah. status that is very very important you know for me I think yeah if that happens the United States dollar will be in for a fucking tumble and yeah. it will not be good for the U.S. consumer um not at all I mean oh, I think that you know uh, could you imagine that it's Russia and China global reserve currency with the Saudis you know the United States would be left out you know, that would be a very, very, very big mistake to let that happen. And how do you even go about getting that back? You don't like not for a while, not for 60, 70 more years. You can't borrow as much money as you can. Your dollar is a lot weaker. You're in an inflation, you know, situation right now. That would be very, very, very scary for United States, Canada, Mexico, everyone on this side of the globe. That would be very, very, very scary if that was something that would happen. But at the end of the day, there's so much fucking corruption that it just won't. It just fucking won't happen because someone's going to pay someone here to pay someone there to pay this, to pay that. And it'll all just fucking go away because at the end of the day, what the fuck has Russia fucking created? Please tell me, please tell me, has Russia created Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, social media? Did Russia create the fucking telephone or the light bulb? No. So do I believe that they can create their own currency? Absolutely fucking not. Unless it comes out of the goddamn ground there, they are not going to create a goddamn single thing. China, China scares me. I think China scares me. Yes, China became the way they are because they've stolen a lot of information. They're good yeah. at it. I mean, they've had the programs where they send people here into our into our country, and they go to our schooling systems, and they basically get jobs and government and education, and they report back. And they are able to steal information from us at faster rates than we ever yeah. could. Yeah. So. The reality is we rely on them so much. They continuously buy our farmland. They continuously get deeper and deeper into our economy. Yeah. And I think they're close enough to that point where they could just shut us off like that and would be in big trouble. You know, I part of me wishes America would kind of just take its footing back and try to rely on itself again. Things would get more expensive. But that was the whole idea I guess Trump was into, not saying I like him or not, but he was saying like America first, you know, bring things back to America and let's be self-reliant again. You know what we changed so much in the last hundred years, we rely on other countries to supply us with these stupid phones and like all of our shit, Yeah. you know, and it's, it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get faster. So those things kind of scare me. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's pretty wild. It is. And also I think that, uh, you know, uh, what what did I read that the United States sold a bunch of their oil reserves to China and yeah. Hunter Biden owned the fucking company? Like, the thing is, is that there's just this level of corruption everywhere that uh, that that like, 
you know, we're just going to keep seeing and keep seeing and people are going to get madder and madder and madder at the fucking system, which is not good for the U.S. either. Right. Nancy Pelosi, we see her making all these trades. She's in the government. She's getting off Scott fucking free. Right. You see stuff like that. You know, well, obviously, that's not really going to be reported on in the states necessarily. But like, you know, well, did you see the new SEC chairman? What? The new SEC chairman was yeah. like her student or something like that. Some crazy connection. It's like, well, no shit. There's no inquiry into her trades, her $20 yeah. million dollar position in yeah. NVIDIA. Yeah, exactly. And people just see that and get madder and madder and madder at yep. the system. That's not healthy and it's not good. And the thing is, is that, you know, I tweeted out the other day, like, fuck taxes, make corruption accessible for all. Because <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day, if you're able to kind of get uh, a little bit of a one up, you know, you won't really care about paying those taxes. You know, if you're able to fucking drive down the road at a at a fucking and I'm not saying this is necessarily right. I'm just saying that people get angrier and angrier when, you know, they see a fucking crown prosecutor pulled over for going 30 over the limit. And then he just gets let go because yeah. of the crown prosecutor. Right. That makes people angry. Right. And so if you're going to keep taunting people and keep making people angry, you know, there, you're at some point, there's going to be a boiling point with these trades that, you know, Congress are doing. And yeah. it's on both sides, Republican, Democrat, they're all banking off these fucking trades, you know? And so, yeah, that's why what, what I tweeted. Yeah. I was like, you know what, if you're, if you're going to say that we're an honest and fair country, but your leaders in charge are not doing honest and fair things, that's a recipe for disaster. And that's a recipe yeah. for collapse on the on the political side, you know? If you ever get a chance, everyone should listen to it. It's a YouTube video. There's a couple of them, but one of them is called uh, Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. It's Ray Dalio, right? And there's a few in there. You can get yourself into like a little bit of a whirlpool of like, oh, look at all these videos. But he does a great job of explaining it because he's basically saying as a country what you're saying. We're getting to the boiling point where people are so fed up and pissed about how unfair this of the world has become i don't say unfair with quotes but how big of the wealth gap has got how people get away the the people who have get away with everything the people who don't have they get screwed so the boiling point unfortunately goes to civil wars civil unrest people being very upset and that's kind of how like empires fall you know that is we are at the kind of the back end of our lifespan as an empire yeah you know and he kind of explains it like it's really hard to fix. It's a little depressing, but, you know, it's good to listen to and it's good to yeah. know. Well, and also, I just want to mention one thing. We can talk about this and then we can kind of go into small caps and maybe start to wrap yeah. it up. But, um, you know, there's been, uh, I don't know if you've seen it with like the World Economic Forum and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but fun. basically, uh, I don't know. It, I think, I believe it's the Dutch farmers or whatever. Yeah. Um, they they had a ban on all their their fertilizer so basically uh you know in that part of the world their government said to the farmers you're banned from using fertilizer now at all so it's like basically how can i grow crops right yeah now in canada okay they are also doing tariffs on fertilizer it's all for the quote unquote um you know uh <laughs> It's all for this green energy, green change. Yeah. You know, you don't use fertilizer because, you know, we're going to go green and we're going to get our, our our food from somewhere else. But we're going into a food shortage. This makes no sense. Uh-huh. There are a ton of food plants that are burning down, just randomly burning down 10,000 cattle that just dropped dead randomly from a quote unquote heat wave. Now they're banning fertilizer in the Netherlands. They're, you know, pretty much trying to ban fertilizer in fucking Canada. You know, that is scary when we're talking about food shortages already. And now you're trying to cut off this food supply. And then we see, you know, our our favorite uh, prime minister, Justin Trudeau, who is investing in insects. Yeah. I mean, what is that? He's investing in insects. He invested $8 in an insect program, an edible insect program. I don't want to eat a chocolate fucking cricket. I'm sorry, bro. Just not something that I want to eat. You know, Dude, so we're, it's insane. That's what th- this is the only thing that scares me is that we're just at a point where there's a lot of confusion. Like I think uh, Charlie Munger actually said it best. He's like, if you're not confused by everything going on right now, 
then you're not doing it right. Something like that. You know, it's just everybody's confused. There's no one except for the people that are in the know, right? Like the, yeah. the highest level of government. We don't know. So yeah. the best we can do day to day is just be the best version of ourselves and be, you know, be smart financially for ourselves. That's all you can do, you know? And I think people overstress it and it's just, all we can do is go with the flow at this point. We're not going to change the course of history. We're not going to change anything. You know, it's just, it's tough. It's tough to sit here and even talk about these topics because it's, it's crazy. You know, never in our lifetime did we think we'd be talking about shit like this. You know, I thought we'd always be talking about like small caps and you know, and what, what that means for us, but which I guess we can actually tra- uh, transition into. We should talk. About, we should hit on that. But yeah. um, let's do this. Speaking of this, small cap market's been fucking awesome lately. I think. Yeah. I think that it shows that confidence is back in the market a little bit, right? Yeah. That's kind of goes into our thesis about the overall market bottoming. Yeah. You know, we've seen some nice volume, and we've seen some nice fades. We've seen some nice trades on both sides of the uh, of the aisle. Yeah, of the aisle. Yeah. And yeah. The the. Uh... <laughs> Freaking small cap blow. Congress. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that uh, it's definitely been picking up. I love it. Uh, great volume. Um, there's been a trade for either side on each day. You just have to be uh, very, very picky with how you kind of go about things. And you have to be, uh, you know, very, very, very selective in what you're trading. And, you know, if you're a short trader and you're going after stocks making new highs in this market, you are going to get wrecked. I mean, we saw it. Uh, we saw it on Friday. Um, and we're just going to keep seeing it, I think. But if you are kind of, uh, shorting those kind of broken stocks, um, you are going to get, uh, rewarded. And as well, if you're a long trader and you're saying, Hey man, uh, how can I kind of, uh, go about, uh, you know, making some good money, it would be going after the stocks, making new highs and not, uh, longing broken stocks, you know, yep. We've, Every we've time transitioned I just from that multi-day, um, oh, yeah. I think. You know, now it's it's kind of back to trading the hot chick, which yeah. for the last, like, I want to say six months, we've been talking about this. Hot chicks have kind of sucked. But now shorts have gotten a little caught off guard. Um, and it's funny because a lot of my focus now is stocks that aren't making new highs, right? Whereas mm-hmm. before, it's like they were so weak. And any stock that did make a new high, there was confidence that it wasn't going to crush you. So yeah, especially on the short side right now, you really need to focus on the stocks that are making new highs and make sure you're identifying like solid range. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, I lost on this stock. I'm like, dude, you're shorting lows on a stock that's up 18%. Yeah. It just looks like it runs because yeah. it's running pre-market, but you can't be chasing that shit. You know, at shorts, it's getting, they're getting killed, right? Yeah. And right now, longs are a little bit more forgiving. They can chase a little bit more yeah. um, and, and they've been okay. And I think also, as if you look at kind of overall market strength, like it's kind of nice. Like we have the the spy starting to rebound a little bit. I'm not yeah. saying that you know we're we're going Marking back up super nice, quick. Yeah. We could be in a sideways channel yeah. for a little bit. I just think it's very nice seeing that overall markets are kind of starting to get a little stronger again. We're starting to see some nicer days in the spy. It's kind of transitioning over to the small caps a little bit. We're starting to see the hot chicks pick up. We're starting to see the multi-day runners hang around where the last like three, four months, it was hard to find a good multi-day runner. There would be new stocks every day. Now we're kind of seeing the same stocks kind of come over again, like TGLT, like CDU, stuff like that. They're holding up. So that is good for the small cap market. Yeah, I'm I'm happy. I like it. Trading's been going well. So So anyway, I think we can probably start wrapping this up. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Last thing I wanted to do before we actually wrap it up. I heard this on another podcast and I actually loved it. So I wanted to do favorites. So give me something you're reading, watching, doing right now that is kind of like taking your attention. Yeah. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Yeah. Let us know in the kind of comments below, uh, what you're watching, uh, any books for us that you think we should read. James and I both like to read, uh, any, you know, any podcasts that you think that we should watch that we could kind of do to, to make things better, um, or any articles as well, link them down below. Like we're always down and and open to discuss new topics. So, uh, what are you watching right now? I think with that, we can, uh, Start to wrap it up, James, if you have anything else to kind of mention. 
No, I was just saying, what are you watching? Give me what something am I watching? Yeah. I'm not really watching anything right now, to be honest. Uh, uh, I'm rereading a couple books that I had read kind of before, like Market Wizards nice. and a couple like psychology books like that. Um, nice. But I'm not really, uh, I'm not really kind of, uh, I'm, I'm not as much as like a podcast listener as I should be. You know, I, I'd like to read and I like to kind of, uh, you know, obviously if I'm on like TikTok, I'll like listen yeah. to podcast clips through there and stuff like that. But I'm not like, it's hard for me to sit down and listen to a whole podcast because I'm like, oh, I could be reading or I could be doing this yeah. or I could be doing this. See, Maybe I if I could combine <laughs> the two. Yeah. So I get stuck driving. So I, I wanted to put one recommendation out there. Um, podcasts on Apple Podcasts. It's called uh, We Study Billionaires, the Investors Podcast Network. I have been crushing this podcast. It's fantastic. Absolutely great listen to, especially anything macro. Uh, they A lot of long-term investing as well and Bitcoin too. So definitely give that a listen if you get the chance. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, All right, so I think we'll we kind of wrap it up, up there. Thanks, great. James. And uh, Thanks, buddy. Yeah.